All right, so you can see me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so uh, thank you again to Majid and Shima and everyone who is participating in this event. It's one of my favorite events uh, uh, since I went to the, f to the first one of mine, I think the la last year or the year before. And I've been really enjoying them since then. I've met a lot of people uh, during those events. Um, and um, without further ado, I'll start talking about my topic. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about uh, Conway's Game of Life um, uh, with the subtitle of Chaos Out of Order, um, which is usually the opposite of what we usually, the, the common saying, which is you're trying to find order out of chaos. I think um, uh, this is an example of where uh, chaos can emerge or result out of uh, a very simple and ordered uh, system. Um, so um, if you're not familiar with it, I will explain to you the rules of the game. It's not really a game. They sometimes call it a zero player game because you only need one person or actually you don't need any people. You only need to get it started. Once it starts, it plays on its own. Um, so there are no, there's no interaction with it while, after it started. Uh, but basically you have a grid uh, of cells. So each square on this grid is a cell and the cell can be in one of two states. It's either alive or it's dead. So the gray cells here are all dead. The yellow cells are alive. And, um, and as you can see, we have three live cells here. And then there are rules that, that tell you whether a cell uh, during an, it's called an iteration. So you start with this and then you say, okay, let's play the game one frame at a time and move to the next frame. So what happens when you move to the next frame? There are rules that govern that. Um, so each cell, the cells immediately around it, there are eight cells around it. So to the left, to the right, top and bottom, and then the corners. So there are eight cells around the cell. Um, those eight cells are called the cell's neighbor. So this yellow cell has eight neighbors, okay? So the rules are very simple. If you are a cell that's alive, but has fewer than two neighbors that are alive, you will die because you're all alone, you cannot survive alone, you will die. You need at least two neighbors, at least. If you have more than five neighbors, sorry, if you have, um, if you have more than five neighbors, you will die because it's too much. So it, it should actually be more than three neighbors. Uh, you will die because it's too much, it's too busy, you cannot survive in this overcrowding, you will die. And um, if you have two to three neighbors, then that's good, you can survive. And if you are a dead cell, if you are dead and you have three neighbors, then you become alive. So the cell can either die or come out from the dead. So gets born or it is alive and stays alive. That's basically it. And those are the only four rules you need. So as you can see, you can look at the rules and tell yourself, I know exactly what's gonna happen because I have the rules, they're very simple, right? So at the cell level, it's very easy. So if you're looking at one square, you know exactly what's gonna happen. Um, and that's the beauty of this uh, uh, game, um, which is that it looks really simple. And, re and, and I want you to also realize that the things that can happen, the things that can happen and, or the things we can talk about are basically either a cell who, that's alive becomes dead or dead becomes alive or stays dead or stays alive. That's it. Nothing else can happen. There is no movement, for example. There is no gravity. There is no you know, uh, energy. There's nothing like that. It's just a cell is either dead or alive. That's it. So I want you to think about those three cells or this pattern now, and, and, and I gave you a hint uh, because I moved too quickly. So I wanted to think what will look like, what it will look like in the next slide. Um, basically this one is all alone, doesn't have any neighbors, so it will die. This one is all alone, doesn't have any neighbors, so it will die. This one is also all alone, doesn't have any neighbors, so it will die. So those three cells will all die. But this cell is gonna be born because it has three neighbors, one, two, three. So there is gonna be a new cell here, but those three will go away. And this is exactly what happens, is the three cells died, but a new one emerged in between. If you go for a next cycle, this cell is also gonna die because it doesn't have any neighbors. So this pattern would have gone for two cycles. So one cycle goes to this, and then the next cycle it's dead, and 
no more alive cells. And so you cannot create anything. You have to have some live cells on the, on the grid to be able to continue the game. Otherwise it just stops. So let's look at another pattern. So in here you have four live cells, one, two, three, four. This one has three neighbors. This one has three neighbors. This one has three neighbors. So each one of them has three neighbors. The cells around them, they all either have one neighbor, like this square here has one neighbor, which is this one. Uh, so the corners have one neighbor and those cells here have two neighbors each. So this one has these two as neighbors, this one has these two as neighbors and so on. So we don't have any dead cells with three neighbors and we don't have any live cells with fewer than two neighbors or more than three neighbors. So whatever that's dead in this pattern will stay dead and whatever is alive is gonna stay alive. So if I move to the next slide or I move in the world to what's called the next generation, you will see the exact same pattern. So it does not change from generation to generation. So this is an interesting pattern, right? So we saw two examples now so far. So we saw this example where you have two cycles and it's completely gone. And then this example where it will stay like this forever, not change at all. And then there is this pattern. So this is a very interesting pattern. So I wanted to, again, you can see the rules on the left, right? And you can think about what's gonna happen here. But let me tell you, it's a little bit more complicated than what you might imagine. You know, it's, it, it sounds, it feels simple, but it is actually a little bit more complicated. Um, so let's look at this one here. This one has only one neighbor. So this one is gonna die. We know that this is gonna go away. What about this one? Um, this one has one, two, three neighbors. So it will stay alive. This one has one, two neighbors stays alive. This one has two neighbors stays alive. This one has only one neighbor. So this one is gonna die. Uh, any new cells that will show up that have three neighbors, any dead cells that will become alive? Well, here, this square has one, two, three neighbors. So it will become alive. Okay, so this one is gonna become alive. This is gonna die, this is gonna die. Um, so let's see that. This is what happens. And oh yeah, the one in the middle here as well. Um, no, see, it's confusing. Um, yeah, so this one was also born and this one was born. So it starts to look a little bit difficult to keep track of what's going on, right? Even though the sim this rules are very simple, but the pattern, um, you know, you have to go through each cell and see what's gonna happen to it. Even though you're making the decisions at the level of the cell, it's easy but you have to do it for every single cell. It takes a lot of time. And it's hard to then imagine immediately, just looking at this pattern, what's gonna next, what will the next pattern look like? Um, but I'll just show it to you. This is the next pattern. And then the next pattern is this. And then it's this. So I wanted to think about this pattern for a second. Um, and, and tell me if you remember this pattern. So this is actually the pattern we started with. So we started here, right? And then we just played through the game and ended up with the same pattern. It, it kind of looks like a cigarette to me. I don't know if you agree or not. This is the cigarette. And that ends up same pattern again, but it has moved down by one square and to the right by one square, right? Based on the same rules, and remember, we, t we said before that the squares don't move, but I, like naturally I just had to say that this pattern moved because we're now looking at the, what's going on at the level of the grid. So we're not looking at each square, we're looking at the whole grid. So at the level of the grid, things are different than at the level of the cell. So in the cell, there is no such thing as moving. There is only death and uh, life, uh, but at the level of the whole, uh, path, uh, the whole grid, uh, no, things can move. Um, and this is actually what happens now. If you look, this is the same pattern, but on a smaller, like on a bigger grid, and you can see it going all the way across. So it's moving all the way down. Uh, so this is an example of a complex system, which means it's a system where the properties and behaviors of the system are different than the properties and behaviors of each cell or component of the system. Um, there's complexity because you cannot just look at the pattern and know exactly what's going to happen. You have to actually play it out. And sometimes it's surprising. You can get surprising results. You're looking at something 
And then when it plays, it, you see something completely unexpected. There is non-linearity, which means that just a tiny change, just like one cell moved to the left or to the right can make a completely different outcome, can give you a completely different outcome um, in, the, in the grid. And then emergence is that you can have rules that are not at the level of the cells, but at the level of the entire system. So this is an example of a complex system. Other few examples, if you look at a computer, you know, everyone says a computer is either a zero or a one. And in fact, if you can construct something called an AND gate, which is basically just a simple, simple tool that takes two inputs and gives you an output, this one gate, you can combine thousands, millions of those NAND gates and create an entire computer similar to the one you're looking at right now. So you're looking at windows and mouse clicks and, 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 and a processor that's uh, computing and everything you're looking at could be re reconstructed in terms of logic um, and in terms of also memory and all of that using NAND, gate, NAND gates alone. Uh, so this is an example of where you have something very simple where you can create something very complex out of it. Um, complex software, uh, out of a, a simple system. So, um, of course, no talk. Uh, sh our talk should always be localized. So this is assembly code. Uh, and what it does is it tells you if a, a Kuwaiti civil ID is valid or not by doing the checksum uh, checking. Um, and, and so you have a very few instructions or operations uh, like load and uh, subtract, uh, shift, the left shift, remainder, that sort of thing. So very simple and few instructions and you can create an infinite number of software and, and, and complexity that grows really big just out of those the same very simple um, uh, building blocks. Um, but the, the other thing to keep in mind is, is this interesting thing. So, you know, last year uh, there was a big bug in FaceTime video calls where someone um, could eavesdrop on your phone without your consent. So what they do is they call you with a FaceTime video call and then immediately swipe up and add so someone so if i wanted to eavesdrop on on someone um uh, let's say person b so i call person b and then i add myself as a third person to the call um and then it becomes a group call and i start hearing their audio before they've answered before they've picked up their phone so i can eavesdrop on someone before they pick up their phone if i do it very quickly they won't even notice uh, their phone might not ring um, and this is an example of what's called a weird machine. So the people who built the FaceTime software had 10 features and they were looking at each feature on its own and thinking, you know, it works perfectly on its own. But then there was something weird, which is you added yourself as a third person to a call with someone else. So how you're already making the call, but now you added yourself and you immediately answered some, something that wasn't expected. And you, you've, uh, discovered a property of the system that wasn't intended, that wasn't even there, it wasn't coded anywhere. No one wrote code to do this. No one wrote code to do this. They wrote code to do other things and you discovered a way to make their code do something different. Um, and so this is an important thing for, it has a lot of security implications. And also interestingly, this is another interesting example I think is, um, you know, in the x86, so for, for geeks of uh, assembly language, in the x86 assembly language, um, you know, I was just telling you about how in assembly you have a few instructions and you can create an entire software out of it. In fact, you can create a whole computer out of just one instruction, which is just the move instruction in x86 is enough to create a total computer. You don't need any other instructions. Um, I think you need one, one unconditional branch at the end to just go back to the beginning, that's it. All of the instructions in between can all be just move instructions and nothing else, uh, which again is very interesting. Um, so um, this whole concept of uh, uh, complexity uh, theory and uh, things that build th things out of themselves and that sort of thing uh, was, was being um, discovered with computers as, this, as computers were being built and people were, were starting to think about computers or what does it mean to to computational theory, that sort of thing in the 40s all the way to the 70s. Um, and, and out of that, this mathematician John Conway uh, came up with this Conway's game of life, which is what I showed you in the beginning. Um, uh, he conceived the game in the 70s. He's been a, a, a active at Princeton University up until very recently. And he unfortunately died in April uh, of this year uh, because of uh, the uh, coronavirus. 
Um, and uh, with that, uh, this is the end of my talk. Uh, so I will now take questions if you have any. Uh, there was one from uh, Haider. Uh, mm -hmm. Panelists cannot post questions, so I'll read uh, Haider's question to you. Uh, he was asking, you're applying the rules based on the previous state and not switching tiles from top to bottom, right? Yes, so you apply, <clears throat> you decide the fate of each tile on its own based on the current generation they're in, and then you switch the whole grid at once. Does that make sense? So if I'm here and um, I'm trying to decide, does this tile live or die? I look at its neighbors and decide and say, okay, in the next generation, it will be alive. But in this generation, it's still dead. Now this tile, is it gonna be dead or alive at the next generation? I decide and I keep that information aside. And when I'm done doing this for the entire grid, then I say, okay, I figured out the fate of each tile um, or each cell. And uh, now I will just display the new cell. So that's what's going on. I don't know if that's, if that's the question or was there something else I missed? Uh, you can use the Q&A section or you can post the chat if it's simpler and you cannot reach the Q&A section. في سؤال لك بالشات. Yeah. So the question is, uh, was there any prediction algorithm used to apply this and uh, fake it? Uh, was the uh, organically done? Is that so? I didn't get the question. Uh, used to apply this and fake it was organically done. I see. Um, so you know the. the you can, so you can, there are a few ways to, um, um, to um, uh, make it more efficient in terms of implementation and the data structures you use. Um, so one thing you can take advantage of is um, the fact that most of the grid is going to be dead. Um, so things like that. So you can change the, so you don't actually have to go to each cell and, and look at all of its neighbors, um, but you can just track where the live cells are and, and then track with their, the region around them. So you cannot have a cell, this is never gonna be, never gonna become alive. Uh, you don't even have to check because it's too far from any live cell. So what you can do then is you can just say, okay, I'm just gonna check the cells within this region. So it's one square away here and one square away here. So this region is where cells could become alive. Um, and then you just apply the algorithm here, uh, or you can start from the live cells and, and, and then calculate the neighbors the other way around, flipped around. I haven't played with that in terms of performance. I don't know if it's better. Um, I don't know if that's the question though. I'm not sure. The question in the chat from Majid Al-Gabandi is, if we can build a whole computer using uh, MOV, how does yeah. this impact quantum computing? Um, quantum computing is different. Um, so, so the idea behind the, uh, the building a whole computer from MOV is that um, uh, is you can, you can, you, what you do is you demonstrate that you can do all the things you can do with other instructions using MOV. So once you demonstrate that, then you can say, okay, I know how to add an MOV. I know how to load an MOV. I know how to store an MOV. Um, I know how to, you know, uh, do a multiplication in MOV. So once you once you have all of those things, you can be done in MOV. It means any, any software then can also be done in MOV. Uh, you don't actually prove the add and the subtract, that sort of thing. You actually go for the, so it's, it's, it's Turing completeness. So you, you just have to demonstrate and you can run uh, what's called the Turing machine. Um, so that's, that's more about, it's more theoretical in terms of, can we use this comp those components? So I, if I give you certain components, if I give you a pen, can you use a pen to make a computer? 
Uh, probably not. Um, I can't think of a way. Uh, if I give you infinite pens, I don't think you can maybe create a computer, but maybe if you take advantage of gravity somehow, you put them together to make a computer, uh, then you're talking about physics. But it's a similar concept is, is if I give you something or, or a group of things or a bunch of things, um, uh, can you create a computer? So we, we said that if I give you NAND gates, uh, in terms of logic gates, you can create a whole computer out of that. If I give you the move instruction in the x86 instruction set, you can create a computer out of that. In fact, if I give you Conway's game of life, you can create a computer out of that. So Conway's game of life is itself Turing complete. So you can actually create an entire computer just using Conway's game of life. Um, and, um, and so the, um, uh, so that's what it means. Uh, quantum computing is more about arrive, how do you arrive to the answer to, of the question? Is my understanding. It's not about um, um, whether you can uh, do computation or not. Um, but I think the problems with quantum computer now are less theoretical and more uh, practical. That's my understanding. But I'm not an expert in quantum computer. So, so please disregard all of this answer. We don't have more questions and you can start your second session. Okay, so the next segment, uh, the idea behind the next segment is to try to implement Game of Life um, in, uh, in Swift. Uh, so what I will do is I will let me create another desktop here. And I'll move this up a little bit. So we're going to create a, a new Xcode project and try to implement the game um, as a Mac app. Okay, so we're going to use Swift UI. That's all we need here. And can create it. Can you see my computer screen? You can see the code, yes. Okay, good. All right, so the idea here is we're trying to create a grid and, and, and populate it the same way we, um, we saw the game play out before. Um, so we're going to... Uh, so, and, and, and Majid, can you remind me the uh, time I have? What time should I end my second talk? It's 15.13 uh, now. You should be finishing at 15.25. Uh, 25. 25. But okay, uh, we so have a prayer 20. break after that. I guess you can take okay. a few more minutes. Okay. So, I will uh, yeah, I'll try to stick to the uh, Yeah, I'll stick to the Okay. Okay. Um, one second. Okay. So uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to show a grid. And uh, to do that, uh, we will create um, a grid. Let's say, let's, let's say we're going to create a grid that's 10 by 10. Uh, so um, a nice demonstration of Swift UI here, hopefully. Um, uh, for people who have done coding uh, on Macs or iOS, especially before using the older uh, kind of technologies like Coco and that sort of thing, Coco Touch, um, and UI Kit. Um, this should be a, a breath of uh, fresh air. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, what's called a V stack, uh, so a vertical stack that goes from top to bottom. And so we're going to have rows this way. Uh, and in that, uh, I'm gonna delete this. in that V stack, we're going to have, um, let's say from zero to 10, uh rows and in each row we're going to have an x stack which is basically the columns there so x stack is horizontal v stack is vertical uh, and for so and then in each one we're going to have let's say let's start with a, um, a rectangle and we're going to make it Red. Let's see if it will compile. Okay. There's an issue somewhere. So V stack. Oh, yes. This is correct. Hmm. Again. Yeah. 
So if you see on the right now, you see we have a grid. So that was nice and quick. Um, and what we'll do next is uh, we want to link this each cell in the grid with a button. Um, so all I have to do is create a button here and give it an action. And then the contents of the button will be this rectangle. So now I've wrapped the button and wrapped the rectangle in a button. But now it looks like the, uh, the Mac buttons, it has the border and everything around each rectangle. So to fix that, we're going to change the uh, button style. Yeah. Uh, train. Button style. Okay. So now they're buttons and we can add an action here for what happens when someone presses the button. And what we will do is we'll print the coordinates of the button that was pr pr pressed. Um, so the coordinates here, we've got uh, the rows which go from top to bottom. So this is, this is the Y coordinate, uh, the Y axis, I mean, and this is the X axis. So we're printing uh, X and Y. And you can see we're already making progress. Um, we can run the game and we can on its own here. That's the problem. Okay, so all right, no, this is not supposed to be showing up. Okay, let's do it here. So we have the game now, and if I press buttons here, I should be seeing in my Xcode console the output of the uh, print statements. Uh, assuming we have this running again. Ah, because it's in preview, so let's do it the other way. No, it keeps insisting on this one. Okay, so we're having technical issues. Very typical, right? Okay. So now we have the grid, and if I press anywhere on the grid, I should see, where is my X code? I should see the output. So now it's telling me where I pressed, okay? So that's step one. And then um, step two is to create a, a, some sort of structure to hold the, uh, we're gonna call it Conway, to hold this data. Um, so we're gonna keep this data in an array. And we're going to say the array is an array of Booleans. So if it's true, it's live. If it's false, it's dead. Um, so an array of Booleans. And uh, for our convenience, we'll create uh, a way to index the array by x and y. And y. And in the array, and there should be a size here. So grid size. Let's say we start at 10, right? That's what we decided there, 10. So when we uh, get a value from there, uh, we're gonna do y times. So it's just a basic kind of math to convert a one dimensional array to get a two dimensional data. data. Bear with me here, this is a bit boring. And we'll get to the fun part in a second. And uh, we're gonna have an initializer that takes, actually it's not gonna take anything, I'll just say, it will just set um, data equals okay, repeating false, so it will be full of Array of false, um, and then grid size times grid size. Okay. Let's see if this compiles. Yes, so we should tell it that it will return a Boolean here. Okay, so now we have a, a, an array that, that stores um, a value for each uh, cell, whether it's dead or alive, okay? And what we'll do is we'll link this array to our data here. So in uh, Swift UI, uh, we're gonna call this array a state array. 
so that the Swift UI system knows that when the array changes, the views will change. Um, so we're going to call it, let's say Conway equals, we're going to create a new Conway uh, data structure. And um, it's a bar. Yeah. And then what we will do is here, when we fill the color, we're going to choose a different color depending on whether the cell is dead or alive. And so the way to do that will be, we're going to call Conway and then give it the X and the Y. And, and this will be a Boolean. Um, so we're going to say if it's true, so the ternary operator. So if it's true, uh, which means that the cell is alive, we're going to make it black. Otherwise, we can make the cell white. Okay. And so that's step one. Uh, we still need to know. You have four minutes, yeah. Four minutes, yeah. Okay. So that's step one. The next step would be to link the um, the button clicks to changing the data in the in the Conway structure. So what we'll do here is we'll say for the X and the Y, we're gonna toggle the value. This is a an operation that comes standard on any Boolean. So we're just toggling it from true to false. And um, if this works, we should see a grid that's now all white. Okay, it's a bit laggy. Apologize for that. And okay, so now if we click on one of them, it becomes black. So that's how we start. Um, we don't have time to go implementing the algorithm on Conway uh, itself. Um, so, but this shows you kind of like almost everything you need to do. The next, the next thing you would do is you'd implement a function here. Let's call it um, tick. Sometimes they call it tick. Sometimes they call it next generation. And it will be a function that's mutating function. So it will change the, the data we have. And what it will do is we'll go through the, go through the grid and uh, uh, figure out if each cell will live or die in next generation. And then, and then make the changes to the data. So once this is done, then what you can do is you can have a button here that connects to tick. And when you do a tick, it will give you the next generation of the um, Conway kind of data structure. And you will see everything changing there. Um, but um, if you want to look at the code and, and play around with it, it is available on GitHub uh, slash Hashimi slash Farewell is the name of the app. So the, I was just trying to, I created it from scratch here, but it's already available on GitHub. Um, uh, except that it is currently, yeah, so it's private. So I'll just make it public. So it should be public now. Yeah. So yeah, so you can access the code and you can see the implementation of the Conway function here. Everything you need is in content view. So it has everything. So this is a full fledged Conway game and it is a total of 100 and basically the implementation is 114 lines. So, you know, very, very small implementation. Um, this function will check how many live neighbors a cell has and this function will do the tick I was telling you about. So it will check the number of live neighbors and then decide um, what to do for the next generation and make the change. And that's about it. And uh, I will end here. I think I'm out of time already. I don't know if I have time for questions. Then I'll leave that to you. Uh, does anybody have questions? I don't see anything in the Q&A or the chat. Uh, 